So tonight we have Cameron Smith. He is a nine year member of the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners. He is a graduate of the Horticultural Technician Program at Vancouver Island University. And he currently focuses his gardening skills on food crops, West Coast native plants and ornamentals, which are both beautiful and terrific pollinators. And speaking of beautiful and terrifically pollinating ornamentals, alliums are one of them. They are not only edibles, but ornamentals. And here to talk to us about them tonight is Cameron Smith. Welcome, Cameron. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, what we've got on screen now are uh, allium gigantic giganteums, uh, one of the taller alliums. And so we'll see that one a bit more a little later. Uh, first off, we have a, a bit of housekeeping. Um, as Kendra said, I'm Cameron Smith, certified master gardener. Um, like to acknowledge that uh, this series is being presented uh, with the help of the Vancouver Island Regional Library, without whom uh, this could not have been done. Um, this presentation is uh, the property of the Vancouver Island Regional Library and the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners um, and is not to be copied. Uh, we will have uh, at the very end attribution credit for all of the beautiful photographs you're gonna see during this presentation, most of which came out of uh, Wikimedia Commons and are included here under one of various open source licenses. All right, what are alliums? Well, think of onions, garlic, leeks, uh, but so much more. Uh, we have uh, the culinary alliums like garlic, um, onions, our regular bulb onions, chives, uh, there are native alliums, uh, like the nodding onion, allium cernuum, um, or uh, the slim leaf onion. We have decorative alliums, uh, allium exporiferum, the walking onion or Egyptian walking onion. Uh, this one is actually uh, decorative and culinary. Uh, I use it quite often in my cooking. Uh, another decorative one is the drumstick or um, uh, the roundhead onion. We also have invasive onions. So the three-cornered leek and the bear leek, and there are a couple of others that uh, we'll, we'll talk about later. Uh, one thing to note throughout the slideshow, you'll see a capital A, A period. This is botanical shorthand. Once you use the, the genus name in, in something like this, uh, um, uh, an article or a slideshow, uh, you are allowed to use just an abbreviation after that. So we don't have to, to type out allium all the time. So we've got familiar foods, uh, onion, uh, allium sepa, garlic, sativum, leeks, uh, ampel, ampeloprasum. Uh, it used to be known as aporum, but not anymore. Uh, chives, uh, sconoprasum, also known as uh, allium tuberosum. Uh, allium tuberosum is garlic chives. And uh, you'll occasionally see those in the, uh, in the supermarket, very long, small uh, bulbs on the top. Uh, also known as Chinese chives. Uh, and uh, you'll especially see it if you shop at uh, the Fairway supermarket here on the island. Uh, shallots uh, are actually a, a variation of the, the regular bulb onion, uh, Allium sepa. And we also have uh, a stipitatum or Persian onion. Uh, Ascalonic, Ascalonicum and um, Oscaninii, uh, I have both been um, uh, it, um, moved into uh, Allium sepa. There's Mount Everest, uh, one of the Persian uh, shallots. Uh, 
beautiful flowers. There's gigantium again. I can get up to three feet high. Uh, Christophii, star of Persia. Allium molly, and this is when we start to get away from the, the big pom-pom type uh, flowers, also known as yellow garlic, golden garlic, or lily leek. Allium siculum, uh, Mediterranean bells. Uh, Insubscribum, uh, the Lombardi garlic from Northern Italy. You'll find as, as we go through these, um, a lot of the alliums uh, developed around the, the Mediterranean basin. So um, Europe, uh, Eurasia uh, in that area. Uh, Ramosum, fragrant flowered garlic, also known as Chinese chives, traditionally eaten in Northern China and Mongolia. And here we go with our walking onions again. You can treat those uh, a lot like scallions. Uh, the bulbs can be very strong in, in flavor. And they're called walking onions because um, these stalks, uh, if, if they get too many bulblets on top, they'll fall over. And once they fall over, the bulblets will root. And left to their own devices, they'll just walk all over your garden. All right, let's get into a bit of botany now. Um, the family is Amaryllidaceae, used to be uh, classified in Liliaceae, the lily family, but uh, that was changed. Uh, if you look over here, uh, obviously they're in the plant kingdom. They're monocots, uh, which means that um, they, they have a single, they, they, the veins in the plant are all linear. Uh, they come up with a single leaf. They don't come up with two leaves like you see in the, in the dicots. Uh, order is asp, asp, oh, oh, oh. knew I was gonna have trouble with this. The family is Amaryllidaceae uh, and the genus that we're talking about is Allium. Uh, apparently it's taxonomically difficult to place something in the alliums. There are anywhere from 200 to 900 species, although most sources uh, go for the higher end. Kew Gardens, uh, the botanical garden in Southwest London that houses the largest and most diverse botanical and mycological collections in the world, apparently, uh, lists a thousand, over a thousand species. So alliums are bulbous, herbaceous perennials with a strong onion or garlic scent, linear, strap-shaped or cylindrical basal leaves, and star-shaped or bell-shaped flowers in an umbel on a leafless stem. Well, that's quite the mouthful, so let's break it down. Bulbous. Alliums have a true bulb as opposed to a tuber or corm or other underground structure. Uh, the bulb contains a very short stem, the basal plate. If you think about uh, a garlic, when you break off a, a clove of garlic, what you've got is this hard piece down below. That's actually a stem, it's a modified stem. Uh, the scale leaves are modified leaves which act as food storage organs. And the plant draws on that uh, for food over the winter. So that's why it's so important with all bulbous um, plants to allow the leaves to stay for as long as possible because they provide food to the bulb so the bulb can grow over the winter or stay alive. Alliums have tunicate bulbs. Uh, they have a, a, a paper shell or, or uh, uh, covering. Herbaceous. The plant does not have a woody stem. There's no hard trunk, there's no bark. And the internal structure of all herbaceous plants is quite different than uh, woody plants. They're perennials. Alliums persist year after year. 
They may die back to the ground in winter, depending on the species and climate, but they will come back next spring. I have leeks that are, that are uh, quite a number of years old. Uh, I have also, um, I haven't tried it with garlic, I must admit, but um, yeah, they are perennials. Linear, scrap-shaped, or cylindrical basal leaves. The leaves all grow from the base, like this right here, or like this. Uh, they come from at or below ground level. You don't see any branches or leaves other than what comes from the bulb itself. Uh, linear means grass-like. Uh, Strap-shaped or lorate, broader than linear, and we'll see some real strap-shaped ones later. Cylindrical or terrate, they're hollow and tube-shaped. Think of chives. If you take a chive leaf and break it apart, that's what you see. Star-shaped or bell-shaped flowers. So here we get some star-shaped, bell-shaped, more star shapes. I don't know what shape this one is. Bell-shaped, bell-shaped. Yeah, beautiful flowers. And finally, a number. Uh, if you look here, all of the flowers attach at a central point. That's what an umbel is. They're all clustered at the end of the flower stalk. That's an inflorescence. In an umbel, the flowers are on short stalks that all come from the central point. Okay, that's our botany lesson. Growing conditions. If we wanna grow alliums, uh, this is pretty general. Uh, some of the culinary um, alliums we'll find are uh, slightly different. Um, they pretty much all want full sun uh, or part shade. Uh, if you can't get full sun, try to go for morning sun and afternoon shade. It wants well-drained soil, as most do. It's not a bog plant. Um, most of them are drought uh, tolerant, so you don't need to do a lot of watering. Soil, uh, acidity, five and a half to six and a half, which is generally what we have around here. So you don't have to worry about that too much. If it turns out you have alkaline soil at a, sorry, if it turns out you have uh, acid soil, uh, add a bit of lime to it. Uh, fertilize lightly. Uh, you'll find when we talk about onions, uh, onions are heavy feeders, so you might have to fertilize them a, a bit more, but always compost and, and a nice balanced fertilizer. Hardiness, uh, well, we don't have to worry about that around here. Okay, onions, allium sepa. Um, originated in Central Asia, uh, wild for many thousands of years before being cultivated. Uh, the original ancestral wild form is now considered to be extinct. Cultivation started maybe 5,500 years ago, maybe even earlier. And people started cultivating because they're less perishable than, than a lot of other vegetables. They're easily transported. They're easy to grow. They grow on a variety of soils, although they want well-drained. Um, they're, they're good as a water source. So you can carry them around um, and they, they contain a lot of water. So you can use them as a water source and they can also be dried for storage. So that makes them uh, very much uh, longer lasting, can't use them as a water source after that, but um, still very nutritious. Um, what have I got here? Onions have been acknowledged for thousands of years for their medicinal value. Um, ancient Egypt prescribed onions in very, for various diseases. Um, over 8,000 onion alleviated ailments. Hippocrates described it as a, prescribed it as a diuretic, wound healer, pneumonia fighter. 
Um, oh, this one was interesting. The ancient Greeks also used onions to fortify athletes for the Olympic games. Uh, before competition, they would consume pounds of onions, drink onion juice and rub onions on their bodies. They ate large quantities of onion because they believed it lightened the balance of blood. Roman gladiators were rubbed down with onion to firm up their muscles. Um, Middle Ages, onions were an important food. They would pay, people would pay their rent with onions, give them as gifts. Doctors were known to prescribe onions to facilitate bowel movements and erections and also leave headaches, cough, snake bite, and hair loss. There you go, man. Planting onions. All right. When we're planting onions, we can talk about sets, transplants, or seeds. Sets are, are just small, immature bulbs, bulbs that were started the year before. So uh, they get going, and then before they get... Um, before they get more than an inch, they get stocked and then just put into storage um, and then uh, used uh, next spring. One of the problems with sets uh, in buying sets is generally you can't choose a variety. Generally, when you go and buy any sets, you're buying colors, white, red, or yellow. Um, and onions, Generally, have, well, you have long day onions and short day onions. We generally want long day onions in, in the north. Short day onions are better in, in the deep south. If you're buying sets, you don't know what you're getting. But we'll get to that because it turns out you can do your own sets. Um, they've already gone through dormancy, so they're ready to go. In the spring, you just put them in the ground. Um, now the picture here, uh, this is in my garden from uh, a couple of years ago. And you'll note that I have them in rows. I, I've since learned that that's probably not such a good idea uh, because what can happen is that diseases and pests can quite happily travel from plant to plant. So I've seen it uh, suggested that instead of that, what you do is plant them randomly throughout your garden. I guess that works if you have a large enough garden. Transplants. Um, you can buy transplants, but more often what you do is you just seed them. Uh, you seed onions indoors from February to March, and then you transplant in April. Uh, three seeds in each cell of a 72 cell tray, and you transplant them as a clump. You thin them, thin them later. Um, if you wanna go with, with seeds, what you can do is um, direct sow overwinter, overwintering onions in August or, or even later. Time them so they get at least four to six weeks of growth before the first hard frost. Growing them. Um, dig plenty of uh, finished compost into the bed before planting. A balanced fertilizer, slightly high in nitrogen. They are heavy feeders. Uh, thin to five to eight centimeters apart. Uh, and use the thinnings as scallions. Always use your thinnings, always use your thinnings. Keep the surface of the soil evenly moist. And weed, weed, weed. They don't like competition. Uh, stop, stop watering in August uh, as you start to harvest. Uh, let them dry in the soil. Uh, when the tops, when half the tops have fallen, you can drop the rest and pull after a week. Cure in sunlight for, for a week, covering at night to protect them from the dew. And when they're done, the tunic should be dry and papery, not soft and moist. Scallions and shallots. 
Now scallions especially are really just um, um, some of these other species like our regular onion, Allium chinense, um, fistulosum, and even once again, our walking onions uh, that just haven't been allowed to um, develop full bulbs. Uh, shallots are uh, generally considered as um, fistulosum. You can direct sow them uh, every, every three weeks uh, from after the last frost date. Uh, 21 to 25 degrees centigrade for the soil temperature. So it likes warm, warm soil. Uh, they'll germinate in six to 12 days and they are fast growing. So you can harvest them, keep planting them, harvest them uh, all through the season. And uh, a lot of these will just continue to grow uh, throughout the, the winter as well, especially here. Chives, sconoprasum, Allium sconoprasum. This is the only species of Allium native to both new and old, uh, the old worlds. So it developed here and in the old world, apparently. Um, so, so in spring, when the soil hits 19, harvest year round, divide the clumps that they will form clumps. You can divide them in spring or fall. Um, the clumps should be divided when they're about 12 inches across uh, and um, replanted about 12 inches apart or broken up for container planting or just other areas in, in, in your garden. Um, Grass-like leaves, um, they are terrate as mentioned before, generally, generally uh, not as high as the scapes. Uh, the scapes you can cut down if you want uh, to try and encourage more foliage. I've often wondered really how much that works. Uh, they're a good companion plant for brassicas and tomatoes and carrots. It has been said to avoid planting um, any alliums next to beans or peas. And I haven't really found um, much good information about, about that. Um, most anecdotal evidence points to, don't worry about it. Your mileage may vary. There's my alley in bed from, from a couple of years ago. And what we've got here, you'll see in, in the break in the bricks here, that's a pathway that goes all the way down. And over here we have uh, garlic. Most of that will be uh, the Gabriola garlic. Uh, nice big garlic heads and really nice plants. Uh, a bit of Egyptian walking onion. There we go again. I do like Egyptian walking onions. Um, in here we have uh, leeks. Uh, notice the scapes on the leeks. Those, are, those produce uh, really nice, beautiful flowers. Uh, we also have some uh, Papaver somniferum, the um, peony head poppy, uh, also known as a, a double flower poppy. And just as a side note, the double flower is kind of interesting. It's uh, caused by a mutation so that the, the stamens in the flower actually come out as petals instead of stamens. And depending on uh, the, the species and, and uh, various other things, if, if all of the stamens turn into petals, then of course it's sterile because it, uh, it can't reproduce. Uh, they can be found in roses and camellias and carnations. These ones were here, um, or their predecessors were, when we bought the place about 13 years ago, but they just keep coming back. They are annuals, but they keep coming back, so obviously these ones are not sterile. Oh, and a bit of meadow sage. 
leeks and peloprosum, one of the national emblems of Wales, that's the Welsh flag. Uh, here's the native range and here we go again, with the Mediterranean basin. This is the Mediterranean and the Black Sea here. I know usually bodies of water are blue instead of the land, but anyway. Uh, they're considered invasive in Russia and Ukraine. Here's Ukraine up here and here's Russia here. Elephant garlic is actually a, 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 and peloprosum. Pearl onions, currants, Persian leaf. Um, and here we go with the Romans again, uh, believe that eating leeks imparted a sonorous voice. The emperor Lear, Nero apparently had leek soup served him every day in an effort to increase the volume and resonance of his or oratations. Maybe I should try that. Um, nicknamed porophage, forum being the Latin for leek, uh, essentially leek mouth. Oh, isn't that a nice one? Um, they're good for a gradual harvest. They stand well in, in the field. I have leeks that have been in my field for years. Don't think I would harvest them at this point, but um, you don't have to pull them all at one time. Um, the goal in, in growing leeks is to blanch the stem. By blanching the stem, as you see down here, it keeps it uh, white and sweet. By the time they turn green, they, they turn quite bitter and tough. Um, which is good for stock. Sow them indoors February to March for a summer harvest. Sow outdoors in mid-June for a winter harvest. All right, how do you keep the, the stock white? Uh, you can trench it or shield it. The goal is to bring, prevent sunlight from hitting the stock. So you can dig a six inch trench or holes as we see here, um, but I always find that that results in soil between the leaves. So I prefer not to do that. What I do, um, you can use PVC pipe, brown paper tied with string around the stalk. Um, these are toilet paper rolls, uh, which work really well. You can even stack them higher if you want. Um, well, they did work well uh, until the past year or two when we changed our brand of toilet paper and the rolls just fall apart in the rain. So I'm gonna to have to figure out something else for that. Garlic. Garlic should not be used to uh, drive off vampires because vampires don't exist. Again, uh, used for food and medicine for many thousands of years. That's ahead of the Gabriola garlic. Um, nice big heads and, and they, they produce really, really well. There are two subspecies, the hard neck and the soft neck. Um, over 600 varieties of sativum, uh, mostly hard neck. The, the uh, soft necks store longer and that's why uh, you're going to see primarily soft neck garlic in the in the supermarkets, uh, and that's also the one that braids. Uh, hard neck forms larger cloves. You may find that the soft soft neck head is is a bit larger, but the hard neck forms larger cloves, and that's what I always go for because I don't like having to peel all the tiny cloves in the soft. So I always, I always go for the hard neck. Um, traditional herbal medicine, garlic has been used to fight parasites, prevent common cold, good luck with that one. Treat respiratory complaints. Um, oh man, here we go again. Uh, rats fed on high protein diets supplemented with garlic showed increased levels of testosterone. Uh, the odor of garlic is caused by uh, sulfur compounds and that's the same with all of the alliums, of course.
Uh, generally, you plant in the fall, September to November. Plant individual cloves. Don't skin them. Take the head of the, the garlic and just break it apart. Uh, put the ind individual cloves pointy and up, which means the basal plate is down. Uh, the tip should be three to five centimeters um, below, the, below the surface. Use the largest cloves. The largest cloves will give the biggest heads. Escapes. Uh, to cut or not to cut. Um, pretty much everybody says cut the scapes so more energy goes into forming the bulb. Eh, I guess. When you cut the scapes, um, you can use them uh, as a, they have a mild garlic taste uh, and pesto is quite popular. Um, I found, I tried to make a, a pure scape pesto it really needs uh, basil. When to harvest, um, let the plants begin to die back. Um, harvest before all the leaves have turned. Be careful uh, when, when pulling them. Don't just grab them and, and yank them out. Um, just uh, gradually loosen the soil around each bulb and coax the bulb out, out, of the, uh, out of the soil. Cure for a week or more out of direct sunlight. Um, the soft neck, once they've been cured, uh, that's, those are the ones that you braid. Hard neck, trim down to about three inches, seven centimeters uh, above the bulb. Let's get into the ornamentals. Uh, most of the ornamentals are early bloomers, uh, late spring to early summer. Uh, when you're planting them, the foliage dies early. Uh, and you'll find this with uh, the, a lot of the culinary uh, alliums as well, uh, as we just talked about with the garlic. Uh, so what you can do is plant them behind uh, daylilies or surround them with a, a, a mat forming a ground cover, uh, geraniums and so on and so forth. Taller species can go with uh, grasses, foxglove and other perennials. Note the uh, uh, Turkestan onion and, and the big strap leaf, leaf uh, leaves here. Another strap leaf lily here, gigantium. Really shows the, the difference in, in heights. We have some late bloomers, splendens and senescents. Uh, you'll find if you're looking for late summer or fall blooming, um, many of what you're, you'll find are actually cultivars. So they're being cultivated specifically for uh, late blooming. Some of the early bloomers. Large variation in size there and color, pinks and whites. Um, a lot of them are, are in the purple range, reds. His Excellency, very similar to Gigantium. Look at the size of this guy, the Globe Master. Some notes, um, alliums may not flower if the bulbs uh, were not fully mature when, when planted. If they were planted too shallow, shallowly, they uh, may not flower. 
if they're overcrowded, uh, if they've been stored for too long, so maybe we're drying out before they were planted. Uh, slow draining soil. There we go again with uh, well drained soil um, or planted in full shade. Uh, if you think they're, they're too shallow, uh, just put your finger down uh, along the side and see if it is too shallow. Um, if it is, just dig it up and replant it or uh, fill it up with more soil if you've, uh, if you've got that ability. Uh, overwintering wet will cause them to rot. Uh, so if, if that's what your soil is like, again, just move them to a, to a different spot. Uh, you may find some of the taller ones uh, need stop, need staking. Uh, these are my leeks and uh, towards the end of the season, uh, I will stake them. And yeah, I, I let my leeks go to flower. Um, I don't harvest all that many leeks, but I just love watching the bees. Uh, and I'm not sure if the, uh, uh, the beekeepers in this area really like that or not. Uh, if they like the onion flavor in their honey, but I certainly like watching them. Propagation. Uh, you can lift the bulbs and check for offsets. And these are um, um, bulbs that are forming uh, alongside of the main bulb. Uh, they're like pups that, that you see on, on a lot of other uh, plants. So you can just break those off and, and replant them, just like you were, just like you, we were doing with garlic. Uh, you get a garlic bulb and you break them off and you replant them and they will grow. Uh, here are my Egyptian walking onions again. Uh, these bulblets uh, will um, reroot. So you can put them in a clump or uh, it's a little difficult to break each one apart. Um, so break the clump um, in half or quarters or whatever you want and plant that and they'll come back. Uh, seed can be collected and sown, but it can take years before they bloom. Uh, same with the offset. Some, it can take a while before they uh, mature and start to bloom. And yeah, they'll walk all over the garden, let alone. Natives, we do have natives. What is a native? A native species is indigenous to a given region or ecosystem if its presence in that region is a result of only local natural evolution. Um, so a lot of the information in here I got from uh, Pojar and McKinnon, plants of coastal British Columbia. Many of you will be familiar with it. Those who are not, go and pick it up. Uh, it's a great resource for native plants uh, for this area. What are some common native plants? Well, salal, evergreen huckleberry, stinging nettle, now I planted some stinging nettle um, many, many years ago. Um, I was called an idiot for doing that. Hi, Tammy. Um, but it, it's turned out really well. I've got uh, a nice little patch back there and it's one of the first things to, to come up in the spring for early spring greens. So we're still eating stinging nettle. Sword ferns, of course. You see those all through the forest. Um, this is one that uh, volunteered. It just showed up one year, several years ago by my front porch uh, and is obviously doing quite well. I'm thinking it probably won't get much bigger than that, I'm hoping. Uh, common camas. Uh, common camas. It was used quite often by uh, indigenous peoples as food. Uh, one has to be very careful when uh, looking for common camas that you don't 
get it uh, infused with the death camas. Oregon grape, both uh, the tall and the dull. And uh, I've made wine with Oregon grape. Uh, it's really bitter to, to just eat, but it makes a great wine. Our Pacific dogwood, um, that's our uh, provincial emblem. And I do still miss the, uh, the dogwood logo on the BC ferries. And of course our Douglas fir. All right, natives, uh, the nodding onion, Allium cernuum, also known as a lady's leaf, found throughout North America. Flowers are white or rose colored, up to about uh, 60 centimeters or two feet tall. Generally found in mountain areas, um, 2,000 feet or, or above. Um, Um, 600 meters, yeah, Mount Benson, the summit of Mount Benson is a thousand meters. So presumably we'll find some uh, Cernuum up there. They're uh, drought tolerant, but shade intolerant. Uh, you can plant the seed in the fall. They are edible, um, but as Pojar states, wild onion bulbs often grow in the same habitat as and can be confused with those of death camas. But the latter, the death camas, do not have an onion odor. Now they must be talking about the bulb themselves, the, the bulb itself, because in, in looking at um, pictures of the various native species of plants known as death camas, and there are several, uh, none of them seem to have an inflorescence like that of the nodding onion. So, um, if you are going to try and, and harvest uh, nodding onion, make sure you know what you're doing. Don't harvest in the wild unless you know what you're doing. Uh, as I recall, the, uh, the, the indigenous peoples would uh, um, mark the location of the common camas uh, so that they could go back later and harvest it and not wind up with death camas and death. Acuminatum, poker's onion, taper tip onion. Uh, it's only about uh, 15 inches tall, tiny, tiny bulbs, uh, but that'll, it'll produce up to 40 flowers on, on a single inflorescence. They are edible. Uh, some sources suggest it should not be it should only be consumed in small doses, but they don't say why. So your, your mileage may vary. Pojar again notes uh, relatively restricted species and should not be harvested from the wild. Always be careful and mindful when harvesting in the wild. If you can find one in seed, certainly harvest the seeds, but um, yeah, just be very careful out there. Be careful. And plectons, the slim leaf onion. This one will grow, grow in clay soils, uh, which is uh, a little odd for um, uh, an allium. Produces up to 10 or 50 flowers. Very few basal leaves, which die back when flowering. Again, very common among the alliums. Blooms May to June. Yeah, look at the size of those little tiny bulbs. I'm you with a pretty tiny flower. Prenulatum, the Olympic onion. Again, found in mountain areas uh, above 600 meters. Uh, grows on, on scree and uh, way up above the tree line in the alpine tundra. Scape is only about to 15 centimeters uh, and it'll produce up to 25 flowers. Very nice flowers with the, the dark vein through there.
All right, the invasives. What's an invasive? An invasive species is an introduced organism that becomes overpopulated and harms its new environment. Think of English holly, English ivy. That's the one we see, uh, uh, where is it? Uh, is it Bowen Park, I think, has a lot of ivy growing up the trees, it, all sorts of parks. Canada thistle, Canada thistle. Uh, it's actually native uh, to Europe and Western Asia, not related to Canada at all, except that it's now been brought in. Um, and I occasionally do let it grow because I love the flowers and so do the bees. Here's one of my Canada thistles with a bee on it. Lots of pollen there. They just love it. And it's really funny to watch them. They just sort of dig right down into the flower and buzz around down there. They're fun to watch. Uh, Daphne Laureola. Uh, many of you will be familiar with that, uh, especially if you go over to um, Newcastle Island. It's just covered with Daphne. Uh, and I'm getting a fair amount of it on, on my property. I'm gonna have to get out there this year, and cut it all down. Giant hogweed, that's uh, the one you really have to be careful about, it'll burn you. Himalayan blackberry, sorry guys, that's, that's an invasive. Uh, again, makes beautiful wine. Uh, Japanese knotweed, of course, and of course, scotch broom. Thought about trying to make uh, wine from that one, but apparently it has some hallucinogenic properties. And so why did I not make wine from it? Hmm. Um, the Canada thistle, the roots are edible. Getting back to that, uh, sidetracking again. Um, although not, uh, uh, not often used, pos possibly because uh, it tends to induce flatulence. Um, Rucolati distillery. Um, on the Isle of Islay lists creeping thistle or Canada thistle as one of the 22 botanical forages used in its gin, the botanist. So there's a good use for, for uh, Canada thistle, make gin. Ursinum, claim ursinum, wild garlic, ramsons, some of you may be familiar with that. Broadleaf garlic, bear garlic. Bear garlic, of course, relates to Ursa, which is Latin for bear, as in Ursa major and Ursa minor. Um, old established woodlands, uh, dappled shade. So again, not uh, really common among the alliums. Uh, damp meadows, not really common among the meadow, uh, among the alliums, streamside, shady hedges. Oh, sorry, back up. Uh, it can be a very invasive plant, uh, as perhaps we see here. Again, beautiful flowers. Nice looking plant overall. Um, Possibly one of the reasons it's so invasive here is uh, we get so much rain that it thinks it's uh, living in a damp meadow. You'll find also that, that uh, I've been throwing botanical illustrations in uh, primarily because I, I really like them. And I, I'm always just amazed at the amount of detail and the amount of work that goes into them. Um, and the amount of time that it must take to, to produce them. Vanille, uh, wild garlic, again, another wild garlic, onion grass, crow garlic, stag's garlic. Uh, and again, like, uh, like our Egyptian walking onion, it forms uh, bulblets at the top. And these fall over and root, uh, grows aggressively, spreading by seeds or bulblets, 
and the underground bulb offsets. Uh, 30 to 120 centimeters tall, two to four leaves, uh, and few to no flowers on it. Triquetrum, three-cornered leaf. Look at that stalk. Isn't that interesting, the way it does that? Look at those beautiful flowers. I've been finding more and more flowers with a, a, uh, a single vein uh, through it. Um, Sidetracking again, one of the ones that I recently ran across was, oh, and I don't remember the botanical name, but it's one of two or three species that we call arugula. And it has this really wonderful cross shaped flower, just four petals and veins that go all the way through the petals from, from the base and then just spread out, beautiful flower. Uh, and it uh, volunteered in my garden this year. That one I'm gonna keep. Uh, this produces uh, 17 to 60 centimeter tall uh, stems uh, with a, a number of only four to 19 flowers each. Uh, very early flowering. Pests and diseases, onion maggots. Uh, Delia antiqua um, is the fly that produces these maggots. Um, they're found, uh, the, onion fly, the onion maggot fly is found throughout the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, it lays eggs at the base of the plant uh, and the maggots crawl down and feed on the roots and overwinter as pupae in the soil. Here you see them feeding on some uh, uh, rather poor looking leek. Botrytis, Botrytis squamosa, also known as blast. It's a fungus. Uh, it'll occur on onion, garlic, and leek, and probably a lot of other alliums as well. It starts as these lesions, white, uh, long white spots. Um, surrounded by a greenish white halo and the tissue then turns soft and the center of the legion takes on a straw color and it'll just rot the, rot the leaf. So I've seen this. I haven't seen the rust. Um, uh, Allium rust, uh, another fungus on garlic, chives, leeks, etc. This is on uh, a leek leaf. Light yellow to orange or reddish pottery pustules. The pustules enlarge uh, and the, uh, it will eventually surround the leaf or, or uh, seed stalk that it's on and girdle it. And uh, everything above that will uh, turn yellow and, and die. What happens is as it surrounds the, the leaf, it's sucking out all of the uh, nutrients from the leaf. And so nothing can get up above. And so everything up above will just die off. Yeah, one of the things to, to remember um, when you get this sort of thing, don't 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 freak out too much. Um, one of the one of the biggest things to do is is just rotate yearly, rotate your crop if you can. Um, keep everything clean. Don't leave um, um, moldy or or maggoty or or rusty leaves lying on the ground. Always clean stuff up. Uh, if you're not hot hot composting and throw them into the municipal compost, um, bury them, whatever, but don't let them hang around. If you are doing hot compost, they're, they're fine to go in there.
on nematodes. Um, they are quite widespread. Uh, I've never had anything like this happen to, to mine. Uh, stem and bulb, uh, well, maybe I have. Um, they create cavities uh, in the bulb, uh, collapsing leaves, bloated tissues. Uh, the bulbs will often soften at the neck. Cutting the bulb in half may, may reveal brown rings. And I've seen, I have seen that primarily in store-bought onions, not in my own. Uh, root knot um, induces uh, knots or galls uh, on the roots, uh, which may uh, uh, impede the uptake of nutrients and water leading to stunted growth. Um, stubby root nematodes, uh, the roots will be short and uh, will turn brown. Yeah, it, it just um, reduces the amount of food that will go into the bulb. Prevention, crop rotation, sanitation, pretty much uh, standard stuff for, for all of your uh, pest and disease. Um, prevention. One thing to keep in mind, again, just don't freak out. Um, pests and diseases like these will not make people sick. If, uh, if you find a bit uh, on one of your plants uh, and you figure you have to take the plant up, do that, cut off the, the disease part and use the rest of it, just eat it. You can cook it, freeze it, use it in soup. Um, also, most of these diseases, well, except something like root knot and stubby root, uh, root knot nematodes and stubby root nematodes, uh, most of these are quite species or uh, genus specific. So they won't, if you see something on one plant, it's not necessarily going to go to its neighbor if it's a totally different type of plant. Uh, these nematodes, however, uh, will move from host to host quite readily. Bit of a bummer. There are chemical solutions for nematodes. Uh, nemocide, nematicides, uh, which are very toxic. We, of course, being the master gardeners, don't generally recommend them. Um, we figure it's just better to, to um, put a different type of plant in there, or in some cases, uh, just starve them. Don't put anything in there. Let it lie fallow for a year or two, if you have a big enough garden. So PNW handbooks uh, lists all of these as pests and diseases for uh, onions. And then alliumnet.com, stop the rot, lists all of these for uh, bacterial diseases uh, of alliums. But one thing to keep in mind with both of these lists is these are these guys are talking primarily about um, large industrial fields, um, monocultured fields full of, of uh, one type of uh, allium or another. And in those cases, of course, um, we, we div we're, we're culturing diseases and pests as well as we're culturing the, the alliums themselves. And so they can spread pretty quickly. Uh, most of these you don't have to worry about. Uh, you can, if you want, go and take a look at, and see. Uh, the PNW handbooks, uh, all of these are links. So you can read up on them, take a look and see what, uh, what the conditions are, what they look like, that sort of thing. Same with these guys. 
Uh, they're all links and, and you can take a look at them. A lot of these don't even occur in this area at all. And actually, I think I'm way ahead of time, but that's it. Um, the end of the presentation contains a couple of slides uh, showing the um, credits for all of the uh, images uh, in the presentation. And that's it. Wonderful. Thank you, Cameron. That was uh, a lot of information on alliums that I certainly didn't know. And I don't know if you noticed the comments and questions coming in on the chat, but Joe Canning uh, did a great job of, of answering those uh, and speaking to those. Uh, Joe, did you want to add anything? Uh, expand on any of the answers maybe you gave? I noticed one question was about how to grow good sized shallots from seed and then what is your favorite open pollinated variety? Did you fully answer that one? Yeah, I find that uh, um, a lot of the bulbous plants, alliums in, uh, included, um, are not um, uh, uh, very uh, fecund, that the seeds, the seed, they don't seed well. Um, open uh, open pollinated variety or not. And uh, I think one just kind of has to uh, experiment. Don't you, don't you find that too? Always, that's what gardening is about. That's right. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and, I, and I never really grew um, any alliums except the Chinese chives and the regular chives uh, from seed. Uh, I was just rotating my crops too often to uh, uh, um, uh, to worry about having my letting my alliums go to seed when they didn't produce that well anyway. Has that been your uh, experience too? Yeah, for, well, I haven't tried a lot of um, seed. Um, I, I do primarily go from cloned uh, bulbs. I have a question that might be obvious to experienced gardeners, but what did you, at the beginning of the presentation, I think you were talking about um, sort of just the typical onion allium and it's, and you said that when half of the tops have fallen off, then you can drop the rest. What, what did you mean by that? What do you mean by dropping the rest? Oh, just, uh, just, just break them, uh, just oh, okay. push them down. So oh, okay. it's lying on the ground, like, like the other half. I've okay. Okay, I see. Thank you. Any other questions that anyone has? Oh, well, have here's you... an here's an interesting one, Cameron. Um, uh, JS says um, has a lot of ornamental alliums and wondering if it isn't just as well to leave the little bulbets attached to the mother so they can populate um, where they colonize. Um, and do you think that um, they actually need to be separated once the mother produces bulbets. No, no. Um, like the walking onion, um, you can just let them fall over and, and start to root. Um, or you can take them off and, and move them to another area of the garden if you want. Yeah, that's what I found as well. And the ornamentals um, that um, have the little bulbets right around the mother. Um, they, uh, they become, you know, independent kids. And I never, I never removed them until I had to um, separate my, uh, um, my whole stand of, of that particular onion. And I'd, I'd let it get crowded enough and then my bulbets would be larger anyway. Right, yeah. Yeah. And we have another new question here about red onions, my favorite. Have you grown red onions from seedlings? Any success? I have not. Okay. Uh, I've, I've been growing uh, onions primarily from sets. Right. Um, but okay. um, I, I think uh, this coming year, um, next season, I, I will be trying from seed. I'm gonna go out to, uh, go out and get some specific varieties 
and start them early for transplants uh, and then put the transplants out uh, in, um, in April or May. Okay. But that'll be my, my experiment. Yeah. Um, another question. Uh, a friend gave me seeds of Korean chives. I've not had any experience with these. Can I sow them now? Do you know? Seeds. Hmm. Korean, chives. yeah, seeds of Korean chives. Hmm. You know, the, the it, it will Korean be okay for, for yeah. chives. They, yeah. they don't have to form big bulbs. Uh, so yeah, I would say go for it. Do it. Yeah. Yeah. And Joe agrees. Great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, oh, she just added that she had bought the, the Korean chive seeds in the States. Okay. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Give it a try. Like you say, everything's experimenting and gardening, right? Yes. I mean, yeah, I was just saying earlier, we have all these microclimates. So something that might not work in, in one little climate of Vancouver Island, it might work in your yard. So give it a try, experiment. All right, we're getting a lot of thank you for the great presentation. All right. Uh, you're all very welcome. <laughs> oh, leeks, do you just leave them over winter and let them keep growing? Well, it depends on if you're growing them for food or, or for flowers. Um, you can plant uh, you can plant your leeks uh, in late summer, uh, even early fall, uh, and then you can harvest them in, in the spring. So they just overwinter, and then you can harvest them. Like I said, uh, I've been leaving my leeks, and I just let them go uh, year after year because I, I love the flowers, and so do the bees. Great. Sounds great. All and right. What I, what I would do um, when, with my leeks, similar to you, Cameron, um, except of course, because we ate all the leeks, I would let those small ones that were a little slow or a little late, I would, I would do that too. I would let them just do their thing until they got larger and older. Yes. And uh, um, uh, sometimes I, we forget that it's a perennial. It just keeps going. And uh, um, that's neat that you grow the leeks for, uh, um, uh, for flowers because they really are beautiful. I'm gonna get into uh, more of the or uh, ornamentals this year. I'm actually gonna start to, to order some. Uh, I've got one area in my garden, which is, uh, oh, quite long, maybe 200 feet. Um, and I'm gonna set up a, a pollinator corridor along there. And so I think a lot of uh, aliens in that would be very nice. Nice. 